Hello and welcome back to the Publisher Podcast from Media Voices. I'm Esther Thorpe and this season Chris Sutcliffe, Peter Houston and I are exploring the people and products powering publishing, both through the podcast and our adjacent weekly newsletter, which you can sign up to at voices.media. We're really pleased to have Blue Conic as sponsors of this season of the Publisher Podcast and newsletter. Blue Conic is the customer data operating system that makes your data work harder, so you don't have to. Whether it's capturing valuable audience insights or activating them with precision, the possibilities are endless with Blue Conic's all-in-one platform. You can learn more about them at blueconic.com, where data is for doing. This week, we're hearing from Brandon Grosvenor, Chief Revenue Officer at Torstar Corporation. Now, over the summer, the Toronto Star became one of the first big publishers in North America to announce they were rolling out micropayments. This is one of my favourite media revenue topics because it's something audiences frequently request, but for a myriad of often quite good reasons, few publishers have experimented with them. Brandon discusses why they decided to try micropayments out alongside their subscription offering, the thinking behind their pricing and day pass strategy, and why he doesn't think micropayments will be a significant revenue stream, but they still have an important part to play in a publisher's acquisition strategy. So I started by asking Brandon what the revenue mix of the Toronto Star looked like before launching micropayments in July. So overall revenue mix of, of the star specifically, and, and again, we're a tourist star, so we do have uh, a number of uh, regional daily newspapers as well as a bunch of affiliated websites. But for this conversation specifically, the Toronto Star, we um, uh, prior to micropayments, we were um, kind of right down the middle with digital subscription and, uh, and print. Obviously, I think like most others, you know, uh, digital subscription uh, is on the rise and, and print subscription is stable to declining. Unique to the Toronto Star is we probably have one of the ro- most robust and stable print subscriber base in North America. And, and that's obviously allowed us to experiment and do other things and not not have to tr- chase the digital subscription line as as aggressively, I guess, at, you know, uh, at the out- outset, but we're at the point now where, you know, we, we obviously have to get much more serious about digital uh, subscriber acquisition. Yeah. Why do you think the print has been such a stable stream up till now? Uh, well, unique to the Toronto Star, it is Canada's biggest daily. I think um, we also, you know, with, you know, it's no surprise that print subscribers tend to uh, trend a little bit older. Um, they formed a habit. Uh, it's a news habit. We also have a lot of subscribers that have been subscribers, you know, for over 20, 25 years. And that's a that's a habit that's hard to break. And we're extremely thankful for that. <laughs> so micropayments is something that has been talked about a lot over the last decade. Um, consumers always say, why do I have to pay for a subscription? I want to be able to access the paper article. But very few publishers have actually tried it. So what made you consider it as a viable option? Viable may be a stretch, Esther, and I, the only reason I'll say that is you don't know until you know, and, and we're in a very heavy um, period of investigation and um, really trying to experiment with options. The, the one thing that's compelling with, with uh, micro subscription or paper article is, um, one, I think it lends itself to our acquisition strategy in the form of And I know we'll talk a little bit probably about pricing options and pricing strategy, but for us, it's, it's an entry point. It's an organic acquisition channel versus, you know, pumping all your money into search and trying to acquire customers off the backs of of search engine. Um, But the other thing too, is there is a subset and there's a lot of evidence that's largely UK based, but a lot of evidence that, you know, there's a certain subset of readers that are interested in, specific content but will never become a core subscriber and we want to see that we want to we would obviously rather have a a valuable stable subscriber but if there's an opportunity open up our advertising ecosystem a little bit more through paper article while getting paid for our content that's a compelling reason for us to experiment yeah and i suppose particularly as a local publisher you're you're going to have audiences come in for stories that are maybe wider than than just the local area you cover that maybe you wouldn't otherwise be able to monetize right yeah geography is a big thing and it's specifically interesting for the star i mean the star being you know the largest newspaper in canada but obviously a lot of people reading content outside of that we don't monetize through uh, traditional advertising channels or traditional subscription so in order to appease those that want to i would say 
consume our content on an infrequent basis, it does give us an opportunity to monetize and uh, probably be much more aggressive on the pricing side because, again, we know you're not going to be a long-term subscriber. The advertising that's localized is of no value to you. So how do we make sure we're being you know, smart and monetizing that content? Yeah. I am really interested in that pricing model you've come up with because I think you've decided on like per article payments or also day passes. So what made you settle on those? Uh, again, I would say settling is, uh, is, is somewhat premature just in the fact that this is very early days for us. Um, we approach everything with a certain level of skepticism, but also uh, open-mindedness just to you know, see if there's a spot in the ecosystem. We, we've, um, the two models that we've come up with are probably our first offering, and, we, and I'll talk a little bit about how we're putting those into um, kind of the marketing funnel around subscription as we move forward. But um, the day pass is actually interesting because there is a commercial opportunity for us there whereby certain advertisers or certain organizations will sponsor day passes on behalf of a bunch of their users. So that's something that's interesting. It also gives us an opportunity to offer a day pass, give people more access to our content. Um, and then, you know, hopefully, ideally, at the end of the day, they subscribe. Um, the paper article is very around, you know, the commodity based, hey, you know what, you show up very high in search because of your equity and your thought leadership in, in you know, the journalistic you know, integrity of the space. At the end of the day, we're willing to pay for one article, but we're living in London or New York or, you know, Houston, Texas. Uh, we just want to read one article and we're willing to pay you whatever we decide is the is the going rate. We probably we may not see you again. And that's fine. Um, but our belief is still that content good quality journalism, those that are quality content producers deserve to be paid for the content they produce. It sounds like there's a lot of things you're kind of keeping an eye on. Are there things you're looking to maybe evolve in the next few months in terms of how it's gone so far? Because I think it's, it's, it's only a couple of months into this, aren't you? Yeah, so we're, again, we're, we're not unlike others. We've probably been more conservative around our approach around digital subscription acquisition. And I wouldn't say that we, we haven't been trying, but we haven't gone as deep of discounts or as you know aggressive an acquisition strategy because we do have a stable side of, of our subscription business, as well as we probably have one of the strongest advertising ecosystems where traffic is important, page views are important. But our subscription, our subscription revenue post-COVID uh, exceeds that of our advertising. So now it's really time for us to kind of press the accelerator. We've been very, you know, happy with recent acquisition strategies thus far. We're learning, we're experimenting, as I said. Where paper article or micro subscriptions I think have an offer is exposing people to the quality of content they get, the ability to show them that, that if they're paying a premium to read one article and, hey, wouldn't you rather for the price you're paying have unlimited access for, you know, a, a small addition to what you're paying per article on a daily basis. So again, we're, we're still very much in our, our infancy with micropayments. And I'm not suggesting this is going to be a revenue stream that gets stacked up as, um, you know, as one of our top performing contributors. However, I still think it's a piece that fits into our acquisition strategy um, and into the marketing funnel quite nicely, especially as we try and limit our reliance on search and specifically no reliance on social in Canada any longer. Yeah, I suppose even if it's not going to be a big revenue stream, it's just it's money you're leaving on the table, isn't it? If people are otherwise not going to subscribe. There is a big I mean, there's a there's an ageism to it as well. You know, we do know that people, um, younger subsets, you know, if if you're under 35, you probably never subscribed or paid to subscribe to a news product. I mean, there's tons of research out there that says once we lost control of distribution, you know, at the advent of IoT, we created a a behavior, a, a muscle that said, hey, why would I pay if I can get it free? Our subscribers are typically very loyal subscribers, buy into, you know, our editorial coverage, buy into you know, our opinion, buy into all those great things that make make us such a, a terrific newspaper. However, to your point, there is a passive audience, in my opinion, that, you know, will pay for quality news. They've been exposed to that through things like iTunes, uh, et cetera, Spotify, other subscription or light subscription based models, whereby, you know, to get source or get authority or get, you know, opinion or counter opinion even on subjects you know, there is a, uh, 
a reputation there that people are willing to pay for as, you know, an authority figure in the space. So again, we're, we're really looking at that. It is a feeder system for us. So I'm not making any, you know, we're never going to open it up to paper article and have an open ecosystem dependent on advertising. It just, that's not our model. We can't chase traffic increases and, you know, lose sight that we are a premium product, something that people are willing to pay a significant price for. So it's a delicate balance. So it definitely is an organic feeder system that replaces probably some of the other tactics we used to use in the marketing funnel. I did have a look on the website and I, I'm aware they're sort of geographical and I, I don't know if you've got any sort of clever stuff going on behind the scenes about propensity to pay, but I kept hitting the paywall and I wasn't actually showing the micropayment screen, which I was really sad about. Uh, if yeah. you, what What's the journey that's been put in place there? Like, has it just blocked me because I'm from the UK? <laughs> No, um, but I'm glad we're blocking you. Um, no, <laughs> all, all, all kidding aside, specifically right now, we have a very uh, aggressive uh, offer and market. Um, it's a specific offer. It's part of our marketing strategy. I can't allude or describe it too much for proprietary reasons. However, um, we have not offered paper article on site as of yet. So um, the strategy thus far has really been around lap subscribers um, or folks that we know are, are heavy users that have not been willing to pay for a subscription. Um, we've had a lot of success out of the gates, but it's really around those that we know that have lapsed, haven't had a subscription in uh, six months and now are potentially uh, want to bring them back in and expose them. Again, I think our acquisition strategy has been solid from that standpoint, because these are people that in the past were willing to pay subscription may now come take another tour and look around. We've made significant changes and upgrades to the Trauma Star specifically as of a couple Saturdays ago. And really we're using that as a kind of reintroduction to get people back in. We will go on on page at some point. Again, we're, we're still vetting it. Um, and really where micro subscription will be placed at, it will be to try and convert subscription versus trying to leave that as a standalone revenue model. Now, you know, hopefully the, the healthy byproduct of that or other other um, benefit of that is that people say, you know, I'm never going to pay, but I'm willing to pay a buck fifty every four or five days to read, you know, an article. And again, it's also very, very helpful in our newsletter opportunity, too, because we can push those those paper articles out, tag them on a story and someone that's not a subscriber, but has signed up for our newsletter, gives them a chance to convert as well. So you said it's mainly been targeted at lap subscribers. Have there been sort of goals or KPIs you've had in mind for rolling that out? Or is it just sort of throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks? No, it's, it's, we have targets. Again, these are loosely based. I think, um, you know, there are a few providers in kind of the paper article space or the micro subscription space. We are probably uber conservative, which I don't mind because we do have a very stable group of subscribers. We are less worried about cannibalism because of the stability of the subscriber base. Our target is really around younger consumption. So I'll give you some of the work we do here in Toronto, you know, being a, a major metropolitan city is, you know, we have a bunch of educational institutions whereby we can offer them day passes around micro subscription, get them, allow students to use for, you know, journaling and, and research and all of those things. So, and again, there's, there's corporate sponsorship that's willing to underwrite a lot of this. So this just opens up a lot of doors. Down the road, we will be looking at, you know, section sponsorship, not dissimilar to what Washington Post or New York Times have done. But again, can we get to a spot where someone's willing to build, for instance, a daily newsletter just with the content topics they want? And we can populate based on whatever they're willing to pay per article and start to uh, aggregate those into a daily newsletter. So we have longer term aspirations for this. Um, this, like I said, is our, our first deal in the space. And right now, I think we're the first or, or recently the, the first in North America to kind of come out and kind of thrust our support behind the model. But we're also not delusional in thinking this is going to replace kind of the two or three layers of, you know, stable subscription, stable contribution that we get in, in through our subscription base. One of the big hurdles when people talk about payments of any sort, whether that's micropayments or subscriptions, is the actually getting your card out and putting your details in yeah that that can take a couple of minutes or if you keep forgetting your your number that you you have to go up and down the stairs to get your card is that something that you're finding an issue at the moment or if people are willing to get their card out for a micropayment do you think they're more likely to then sort of once their payment details are in the system they've already given you some money so they're more likely to give you more yeah i think it's 
We've also set the meter pretty low. So again, you know, uh, for us, we're working with Axe 8. So if you, most people will not make purchases of, you know, a dollar on a credit card. So the hope there is that you load $5 and then, you know, we can now, now that we know that you've signed up, we can start to push content that we know you've consumed and try and pay for it. The again, yeah, you, you, the card information's in the system. The other thing that we are really interested in, and we've had conversations with other major publishers in uh, Canada and some in North America, uh, some in the U.S. as well, um, around creating a paper article ecosystem whereby we know you're a passive reader, you're a news enthusiast, but you want uh, you want information from multiple sources. You want to make sure you have a you know a balanced uh, interpretation of whatever the news is. Our hope is that others will accept the technology. It's very light lift. We can actually, if someone's got a, a wallet and another publisher has that technology, they can port that wallet over to reading a story in the New York Times, you know, The Guardian, Washington Post, Globe and Mail. The, the hope is that this becomes a bit of an ecosystem and, you know, dare I say, replaces something like Apple News, whereby it's a way for people to consume news without having to pay a tax for ad tech to actually enable it. So, Again, it's early days. You know, it's, I learned long ago, you, you don't stand in front of a trend. You know, you, you've got to move along with it. And like I said, we're, we're taking a pretty balanced approach to testing and seeing where it fits within, you know, our acquisition strategy. Yeah. Would that be something you roll out across your other titles at Torstar? Yeah, we, we will have, it'll be fully implemented in all of our subscription-based products. And then the other thing with, you know, a lot of our community-based products where, you know, we are spending a significant of time, money, cultivating and producing local news where there's even a donation model where if people want to keep consuming, you get a free subscription. Um, but, you know, you want to leave us a dollar or five dollars a month just because you like your local product and you want that to survive. And we've seen that, you know, across the UK as well, where those, some of those models work as well, where they work nicely with an advertising supplemented um, monetary kind of model. Yeah, that sort of... <laughs> Relying on people's people's love of your product. Yeah, I mean, it's, but it's it's like where do people go for that news now? I mean, you know, we've got we've had certain rules in Canada where, you know, for instance, Meta, who is one of the largest amplifier of community news through you sharing in your community a news article. We've had legislation where the belief is um, that's shared amongst most of those that are actually creating the content that you know if you're amplifying that content for commercial gain, you should pay for it. Meta made the decision to kind of leave and not amplify that. We have to find other ways to monetize. And that's, you know, we're finding there's a lot of direct traffic through the homepage versus going through our traffic's actually stabilized. But again, it's we still have to pay to keep the lights on and be able to produce that great, great local content. And, and um, this provides us a gateway to do that. So that's interesting that if people don't see publishers in in their social media feeds, that there is a tendency to go direct. That's really interesting. I know that's not the topic of this conversation. It's, it's, <laughs> it's very, it's very kind of urban versus rural, right? It's it's utility based content, community news, really important. Unfortunately, with the you know downward pressure on advertising as well as losing the scale game, losing the um, distribution game. You know, people find it harder to find that content. So Google's still a very big provider, for obviously, for traffic around local utility. But I think people's nature is once they've found a local site that gives them what they need, they bookmark that site, you know, or the app, and they start to build out that utility-based case. And that's just really what we need, you know, local weather traffic, you know, breaking local news, all of those things. It's a, it's a costly venture because obviously you're not monetizing larger market, you know, penetration and, and scale. But it's still critically important for the democracy of all of our communities. Yeah. But I mean, even search is a bit of a rocky foundation now with all the AI stuff coming in. Like, Well, and it's, yeah, it's, it's again, it's um, the last three years have been, you know, probably more chaotic than the last 20 years that I've been in this business. So the, the um, I mean, I, I would say I think it's an exciting time for us. I said, just in the fact that I think, I believe, truly believe that technology at the outset of IoT was a hindrance to traditional publishers because we just didn't know what we we're getting into. We didn't know that just free and, and unaudited, unaudited access to our content, what that was going to do to us. And then obviously when we realized it was too late and you know we had a duopoly and that's all fine. We now need to figure out a way to how we work with, with, with big ad tech 
but also protect our investments and, and, and make sure that we're making life better for Canadians. AI is going to turn that on its head and actually like exacerbate that. But I do believe we're at a, a point where technology can enable uh, traditional media businesses and specifically news publishers versus it being a hindrance. We are, we're creators and there's always going to be a space for creators, but that business model changes. And, I, and my firm belief and whether I'm right or wrong, I guess we'll see over time is there's a, a place for, you know, what I would say subscription to a news product is a premium product. You know, you're subscribing and commodity news will be produced and distributed in, in channels that are probably largely free, but we should have equity in both of those channels. I think people do understand that and they do understand the value of local news, but I guess it's just the behavior when it's been free for so long is going to, it's going to take a while to turn right. really. Well, I, you know, I watch, I have a nine-year-old daughter and I watch her con- consumption habits and I just, you know, shake my head, but you know, they, <laughs> have, they have, they have access to so much. The problem is, is so much of it is trash and, you know, there should be, in my opinion, there should be a, a responsibility around distribution and how this gets out there and how much, you know, uh, you know, we can go into a whole other pod on, you know, democracy and journalistic integrity. But the reality is I'm hopeful and enthusiastic about where specifically the Toronto Star and, and our company can play a role. And again, we have scale. So how do we make sure we get continue to get do the work we, we love to do and the good work we do and make sure that we make it accessible for as many people as possible? Just a really boring technical question before we move on. If you pay for an article or a day pass and then decide to upgrade to a subscription, is that like a separate payment system? Would you have to get your credit card out again or is it all integrated? Uh, it's, I would, it's not integrated. They're separate systems for a reason. Again, it's, it's, there's, there's, and I'm not the technical guy, so please don't hold me to account. But again, it's, it's a very seamless process for for anyone that does that. If you're given the question, you buy an article, then you come back, your payment runs out. There's a very easy, seamless way that ports your information. You will have to re-enter your credit card just because they are different systems. Um, but by that point, and at least the research we've done initially, that that's not an issue because you are making a purchase decision versus feeling like, oh, well, I don't really want to do this. It's conversion versus you know uh, bait and switch. And, that, and it's a very important distinction to make. So you launched these in July. How is it going so far? Has it met any surprises? Has it met expectations? Our, our uptick, on again, we're only really testing at this point lap subscribers off our network. So we're not offering you, like I said, we're experimenting in two ways. One is a uh, underwriting of potential sponsorship. We have a lot of interest in the channel. A lot of people are, um, you know, again, wanting to support our, our educational institutions uh, medical institutions, charities, those type of things. And, and so that's been what I would say a push sale opportunity where we bring the opportunity forward. But moreover, we're extremely surprised by the conversion of lap subscribers that have come in to buy different articles. We, we are benefiting Esther from a pretty heavy news time. You know, we've done a lot of research and a lot of people made significant advances during COVID around hardcore acquisition strategy and digital around moving people over probably they were in more dire situation around print consumption you know they were utilizing much more i would say effective marketing strategies but it was you know low price point and then get in and, and convert uh to, to major success it's very hard to do when you've got a slow news time or you know people are fatigued we found coming right out of covid a lot of news fatigue and we saw it in traffic amongst our comps and and news publishers across the world but we are in a pretty good news cycle right now. You know, locally, we're in a, a political kind of uh, situation, you know, around around our leadership. You've got the U.S. elections. Unfortunately, you've got a ton of unrest in the Middle East. You know, you've got tropical storms that are by. So, again, it's really for us, it's around taking advantage of, you know, the iron being hot, but also offering opportunities for people that want to engage with our product at different levels. The, the challenge for us is really balancing the advertising and subscription ecosystem because we're in a time of great demand on the advertising side as well. So it's, you know, it really is an optimization and a balancing act. Okay. Okay. Just as a final question, micropayments, I've already mentioned at the start, it, it's something you're one of the few doing. Why do you think that is? Like, is it a timing thing that there was a huge subscription bump and people maybe haven't got around to trying other things yet? Or is it a tech issue? No, I would say we're probably one of the more bullish publishers in the space now. 
Um, you know, when we got into this, we knew there was a couple others talking, we are the first in Canada. Others have experimented with it, but the technology was far lacking. You were on one platform, heavy tech, terrible page load rates. Uh, it got to a point where we have a lot of very smart digital natives in our business now. Um, you know, the product is much better. The understand the data sets that we can see are much better. Yeah, I think I think we just have a more, more informed journey. We just changed CMSs, so I think for us, it's uh, it, the time was to do it. But you know, we we've tried to become more nimble around. We're not going to stay married to anything that isn't working. But this was the right time to try it. And again, we've been extremely impressed, uh, surprised, and optimistic about this becoming part of our acquisition strategy. Certainly not a standalone acquisition strategy, if you will. Thanks so much to Brandon for speaking to us. Now, don't forget, we have a write-up of the key learnings from this interview on Voices.media or dropped into your inbox every Tuesday if you sign up to the publisher newsletter, also on Voices.media. This season is sponsored by Blueconic, the operating system that puts data into action for marketing and growth doers. Their industry-first solution empowers doers with an unmatched range of capabilities to access relevant customer data, create resonant customer experiences, and drive maximum returns for their business. You can learn more about them at blueconic.com, where data is for doing. And we'll be back next week with another dive into the people and products powering publishing's future. But until then, you can keep up with all things Media Voices by following us on LinkedIn and subscribing to the publisher newsletter over on voices.media. Until next time.